So, jetzt haben wir die akademische zehn Minuten, Viertelstunde eingehalten. Ähm, einen schönen guten Abend. Äh, mein Name ist Thomas Geisel, ich bin der Geschäftsführer des Werkraums Regen Zerwald. Bin heute, äh, oder wir sind heute hier zu Gast äh, in der FH Vorarlberg. Äh, ich möchte mich hier schon mal ganz herzlich für die Möglichkeit bedanken, äh, einen für uns sehr wichtigen Vortrag im Rahmen unserer Sommerausstellung Alphabet des Lebens Lernwerkstatt Natur äh, hier abhalten zu können um auch mit unseren Projektpartnern, äh, die wir in der Vorbereitung des Projektes äh, mehrfach konsultiert und kontaktiert haben, nämlich die FH Vorarlberg, aber eben auch das Designforum äh, Vorarlberg, Inatura, äh, und, äh, äh, mit denen wir auch äh, im Austausch und Vorbereitung des Projektes waren, hier äh, in Dornbirn zusammenzuführen, damit nicht alle in den Bregenzer Wald fahren müssen wo es manchmal ein bisschen länger dauern kann. Ähm, ja, Alphabet des Lebens, Lernwerkstatt Natur. Natur ist äh, im Bregenzer Wald äh, natürlich äh, allgegenwärtig, so allgegenwärtig, äh, dass sie für uns, äh, die wir dort leben und arbeiten, vielleicht gar nicht so äh, äh, auf der Hand liegen, sich damit äh, inhaltlich tiefer auseinanderzusetzen. Die im Werkraum vereinigten Handwerker gehen davon aus, dass sie aufgrund ihrer, ihres Lebensraums, ihrer Arbeit ohnehin einen sag ich mal, sehr engen, respektvollen Umgang mit der Natur haben. In vielen Fällen einen sehr intuitiven, man bezeichnet das dann auch als altes Wissen, manche mehr, manche weniger. Und äh, für mich äh, war es ganz einfach auch mal sehr spannend, wie diese Projektidee auf mich äh, zugekommen ist, eine Ausstellung zum Thema Natur äh, zu machen, ähm, ein, ja, dieses Projekt zu starten. Äh, die beiden Kuratorinnen Elisabeth Kopf und Regina Rowland, die ich auch heute hier begrüßen möchte, ähm, haben sich zusammengetan und sind eben auch äh, mit einer sehr spannenden äh, Methodik äh, in diesem Projekt auf uns zugekommen, Biomimikry, äh, für mich damals noch ein neuer Begriff äh, und für die Handwerker äh, so und so, äh, so dass ich es eigentlich sehr spannend gefunden habe, wie wir einerseits dieses ähm, akademische, theoretische, natürlich auch in der Praxis ausprobierte Wissen einerseits äh, zusammenführen können, mit der praktischen Zugangsweise, mit der Arbeit der Handwerker, um hier auch ein gegenseitiges Lernen auf Augenhöhe zu ermöglichen. Ich glaube, dass uns das in den letzten zwei Jahren, die dieses Projekt auch in Vorbereitung gedauert hat, uns gelungen ist. Es ist ein Prozess. Ich bin schwer beeindruckt, was eben die Biomimikrie in 26 Lebensprinzipien zusammengefasst hat, wofür die Erde 3,8 Milliarden Jahre gebraucht hat. Ähm, wenn man sich diese Prinzipien näher führt, äh, sagen manche auch, äh, das klingt nach gesundem Hausverstand, das ist vielleicht auch genau das, warum es auch sehr nahe liegt äh, äh, dem Handwerk. Äh, und für uns war es eben sehr spannend in diesem Projektprozess, äh, das praktische Tun äh, auch äh, mit dem theoretischen Wissen abzugleichen äh, und äh, daraus auch zu lernen. Ich freue mich jetzt ganz besonders, es ist ein Höhepunkt dieser Sommerausstellung, eine der Gründerinnen von Biomimikry 3.8, nämlich Dana, Dr. Dana Baumeister und ihren Mann Thomas, Dana, äh, Thomas Baumeister hier bei uns begrüßen zu dürfen. Ähm, äh, das erste Mal, äh, dass es einen Vortrag in Österreich zum Thema Biomimikry und beziehungsweise dass äh, Dana Baumeister über das Thema und ihre in ihrem Innovationsansatz hier spricht. Ich glaube, es ist auch eine Premiere, dass beide miteinander sprechen äh, in einem Dialog. Äh, ich freue mich ganz besonders, äh, dass das auch äh, durch äh, die Verbindungen von Regina Rowland äh, möglich war, sie nach Vorarlberg zu bringen. Und äh, freue mich natürlich, äh, dass wir auch diese Gelegenheit nutzen, äh, dieses, diesen Vortrag auch Teil dieses, der Vereinigung des European Bio, der European Biomimicry Association äh, als Programmpunkt zu haben, äh, die ich eben hier auch begrüßen möchte, äh, die extra angereist sind und natürlich auch die Ausstellung als Hintergrund zu nehmen. 
Die Ausstellung an sich, glaube ich, ist auch eine Premiere in Österreich, das Thema in einer Ausstellung zu thematisieren. Vielleicht auch wiederum ein ja, Pioniermoment in der Geschichte des Werkraums, für ein Thema auch eine Vorreiterrolle einzunehmen. Die Ausstellung nennt sich bewusst Lernwerkstatt und nicht Ausstellung. In der Entwicklung der Ausstellung haben wir, haben wir gemerkt, dass es noch viel zu tun äh, und auszuprobieren gibt. Äh, so gesehen ist es eigentlich ein ähm, Start für einen längeren Prozess äh, und diese Ausstellung soll natürlich dann nicht vorüber sein, wenn am 6. Oktober die Ausstellung schließt, äh, sondern ist der Auftakt äh, natürlich weiterhin in diesem Sinne auch weiter zu arbeiten ähm, und ich freue mich äh, auch natürlich äh, weiter in der Zusammenarbeit mit in Natur, mit dem Designforum äh, an diesem Thema nachhaltige Gestaltung, naturinspiriertes Design zu arbeiten, äh, das eben auch im Bereich des Handwerks der Architektur immer mehr von Bedeutung gewonnen hat. In diesem Sinne wünsche ich Ihnen einen anregenden, inspirierenden Abend. Äh, darf Regina Rowland äh, zu mir bitten, die die beiden Vortragenden noch kurz vorstellt. Und möchte mich eben an der Stelle noch einmal für die Möglichkeit bedanken, hier im FH ähm, den Vortrag halten zu können. Meine Projektpartner, äh, FH äh, Dornbirn Design Forum Vorarlberg und eben auch die Natura und die beiden FHs Burgenland und ähm, Eisenstadt, wo die Regina unterrichtet. Regina, bitte. Welcome to our biomimicry lecture and thank you Thomas for having invited us to uh, design this exhibit. It is a first in Austria and uh, it, it took for you to be brave about letting us introduce this new topic since it's not well known in Austria yet. So usually when we, when we introduce the topic it's like bio what? And so it, it takes a lot of uh, explaining uh, what it is and how to use it and how to apply it and uh, designing a, a visual exhibit that also brings it down to a level where everybody can really access it uh, is a, a challenge to do. And so thank you Elizabeth uh, Kopp for working with me on that. We're very honored to have Dana Baumeister here and Thomas Baumeister. I am one of their students and several of their students are also sitting here. And so it is a great pleasure for us to welcome you. And uh, we really thank you for being here and for having taught all of us and inspired the love for nature and uh, the techniques and the process to work with it. Very honored, thank you. I'm gonna give you a few details about their background. So with a background in biology, a devotion to applied natural history and a passion for sharing the wonders of nature with others. Dana has worked in the field of biomimicry with Janine Benius since 1998 as a business catalyst, an educator, researcher, and design consultant. Together, they founded the Biomimicry Guild, the Biomimicry Institute, and Biomimicry 3.8, collectively fertilizing the movement of biomimicry as an innovative practice and philosophy to meet the world's sustainability challenges. Dana is a natural systems thinker and brings a unique perspective to her work to help others to see nature as a model, measure, and mentor. She has helped more than 100 companies consult uh, the natural world for elegant and sustainable design solutions, including Nike, Interface, General Mills, Boeing, 
Herman Miller, Cola, seventh generation and Procter & Gambler. Dana designed and teaches the world's first master program in biomimicry as a professor of practice at ASU, Arizona State University. Co-founded the Biomimicry Center at ASU and compiled more than 20 years of experience in biomimicry into the Biomimicry Resource Handbook, a seed bank of knowledge and best practices. Dana lives with her family in Montana, where she is a gardener, a green remodeler, a hunter-gatherer, and a naturalist. Thomas Baumeister co-founded and currently runs Access Wild, a business devoted to introducing people to the wilds of the West. As faculty associate at Carroll College and, and Arizona State University, he teaches courses in the science, ethics, and practice of animal welfare, wild animals and society, the human nature connection, and the biomimicry ethos, a pathway from practice to philosophy. While serving as Conservation Education Bureau Chief of Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, Thomas facilitated the establishment of Montana Wild, wrote the state's Hunter Education Manual, and chaired the Committee for the International Hunter Education Association to develop U.S. Hunter Education Standards. In addition to serving as board president of Orion, the Hunters Institute, he also serves on the board of the Helena Hunter and Anglers Association and is chairperson of the Montana Outdoor Hall of Fame. Thomas has been recognized as a professional of the year from the International Hunter Education Association is a three-time recipient of the Montana Governor's Award for excellence in performance. He holds a master's degree and a PhD in biology and wildlife biology from universities in Germany and in Montana. Together, they have taught over a thousand people and um, they have a lot of experience helping us learn how to learn from nature and how to work with nature. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you everybody for coming inside. It's such a beautiful day outside. It feels kind of strange to be wanting you to fall in love with nature and asking you to come away from it for a little bit of time here. But we're going to begin and hopefully give you some new ways to think about your next adventure, uh, perhaps engaging with the natural world. So I'd like to start with the question of is human cleverness the key to living well? Living well on this planet, living well as humans in the spaces that we occupy. This is actually a, a, a neuron, a neuron in our brains. And for far too long as a species, we've really come to believe that all of the answers to all of our challenges are just up here. And if we can just fire those neurons a little bit more and a little bit more in different ways, then perhaps we can solve our challenges. Um, my answer to this question is, well, maybe, uh, except for the fact that, um, you know, Einstein reminds us that the same thinking, those same neurons that got us in the current situation are not going to actually help get us out of the current situation. And perhaps we need to rethink differently about how we as a species begin to live on this planet. Um, as you know, and I don't like mentioning more than necessary in any of, our, of my talks, is there's a lot of troubles that we're facing as a species, everything from plastic pollution to climate change to health uh, challenges that, uh, you know, not being able to take care of our bodies, not being able to take care of our rivers, and so on. So we really need an opportunity to begin thinking about things a little bit differently. Um, because this is the only blue marble that's out there. This is the only planet that we get to call home. And if we can't figure out how to live here, we don't really get to go anywhere else. So there's some real strong need and initiative to try to figure that out. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that, yeah, this planet is ours, but it's not ours alone. We aren't the only living beings here. In fact, 
We share the planet with anywhere from 30 to 100 million species. And, you know, of course, we haven't even given names to more than 1.8 million of those species. So there's a whole bunch more that we've barely even been introduced to. We just know that we share this space with. Now, the species that are on the planet and life itself uh, has been here for quite a long time. Uh, in fact, we know that we, life started in the sea and these species span everywhere from our coasts in the Pacific uh, to the redwood forests and the beautiful trees around us up to the high alpine meadows here in Bregenzerbal. And we're surrounded by this genius. But I want to put it a little bit of perspective into, you know, what does it mean to share this planet with all of these other species? We know that Earth has been around for 4.5 billion years. And billion doesn't actually sound like that much. Um, I don't know what you're facing here in Austria, but in the United States, we have trillion dollar deficits, right? So billion doesn't sound like very much. So let's take four and a half billion, though, and get our heads wrapped around it by compressing it into one year. So that January 1st, just a breath before midnight, is when the planet was born, when Earth showed up. And December 31st, just before midnight, is when we are gathered here this evening in this auditorium. So let's look at that one year and what's happened on the planet. Well, for the first seven weeks or so, it was the whole volcanoes and molten rock and gases and all the things that did not make life very hospitable. Uh, and so there was no life. But 3.8 billion years ago, life showed up. And in fact, those early life forms, which are called stromatolites, are still here today. Probably not the same individuals, but the same kind of organism still exists on this planet today. So they've been around since February 25th, and that's where 3.8 in our, our name, Biomimicry 3.8, comes from, is the 3.8 billion years that life has been here. And it wasn't until a full month later, March 28th, that we see photosynthesis. So that's the first time that life is able to make energy out of sunlight. And then it's really single-celled organisms all the way until August 16th. March and April and May and June and July, it's just in the sea, a lot of single-celled creatures. And they start joining together in mid-August. And then by mid-September, they start mating. That's when we start seeing sex. We start seeing genes mixing. And when genes start mixing, all sorts of possibilities arise. But it's not until just six weeks ago, November 15th, that the first organisms show up on land. Okay. So for the first 10 and a half months, it's all been happening in the sea. So first colonization of terra firma by the fungi, <coughs> by the mushrooms. They're the first ones to be able to break down the rocks. Meanwhile, in the sea, we see our first vertebrates, our first organisms with a backbone, show up on November 20th. November 22nd, we start seeing land plants. November 24th, the insects soon follow, are capable of pollinating and moving seeds around from the plants. The amphibians show up December 2nd, slowly moving their way out of the water, and eventually learn how to build tough skin, and we start seeing reptiles on December 6th. Of course, these were the dinosaurs, and they ruled for a long time, but they didn't even show up until December 6th. Mammals, sort of our group of organisms, are only two weeks on the planet. Birds, even less time, the 18th. Flowers, believe it or not, didn't show up until 11 days ago. And then um, Christmas was a really bad day for the dinosaurs. Um, so that's when the asteroid hit and dinosaurs went extinct. We think of that happening a really long time ago, right? 67 million years ago. That was really just less than a week ago in our compressed timeline. And hominids, the first um, two-legged creatures, not Homo sapiens, our species, showed up today, about 12 and a half hours ago. 
And humans have actually only been here for 36 minutes <laughs> on the planet. Okay. Now keep in mind what's very interesting about those 36 minutes, if we unpack humanity's 36 minutes, break it down into more digestible chunks, the agricultural revolution, when we learned to put seeds in the ground so that we weren't hunter-gatherers anymore and we stayed in place, that was, that's just this square here. For those 36 minutes, the vast majority of it, we were hunter-gatherers on the landscape. The industrial revolution, which kind of defines life as we know it, where we get ideas from, how we go about doing things, kind of defined by the industrial revolution. So that shows up here. I'm not sure if you can see it. That's how long that all of our answers about how to live on this planet have been here. Right? There it is, zoomed in for you, in case you missed it. In that full span of that full year, this is that amount of time. So agriculture, again, one minute. The entire Industrial Revolution, two seconds of the entire time that we've been on the planet. So given that it's been here a long time, and this is the world as many people know it today, <coughs> it begs the question of, you know, have we, have we lost nature? Um, at a time when we really need her most, we are the only species that has to design equipment to protect ourselves from ourselves. That's sad, <laughs> really sad. And so what are we going to do? Can we shift our focus from sort of this sort of stale, old thinking um, to maybe start looking here? Yeah. What do you do when you get stuck? When you get stuck trying to solve something. When you try to solve a problem, you face a challenge. What do you do? Many of us will turn to friends, families, people that we trust. We look for ideas. We look for solutions. We look for ways to solve the problem. What we are suggesting here to you tonight is that maybe we look to our cousins, to our friends, to our family, not our immediate family, but our extended family. As Dana mentioned, we are a fairly young species, but we share this planet with many other species. So why not just limit it to family and friends? Why not limit it to all of life? And that's the promise, that's the idea, that's the concept that we're trying to convey to you tonight. And the impetus for reaching beyond the familiar really <coughs> also lies in our history. Our history of living on this planet is shaped by our connections, by our relationships with nature. This idea of drawing inspiration, drawing ideas, possibly finding solutions in nature is not really anything new. And so here I just identified a few ways in which we, over the course of our history as a species on this planet, the way we've interacted with nature. Clearly we receive sustenance from nature, whether it's the timbers that are being harvested and the Brugenza Wallet that make it down to the background and are um, formed into new things and made into art and furniture and all sorts of things. There's clearly a strong element, um, especially in your culture here, where you rely on nature's services in terms of food, fiber, water, etc. But then it doesn't just simply limit it in terms of just what we get from nature. 
but we have certainly had a considerable impact because we have increasingly separated ourselves from nature we have this desire to connect to reconnect with nature so we find places to visit nature a little sensitive to that I'll do it. No, let's go next, next one. There. And nature is not just a place that we visit, but we use nature as a way to express how we feel. It's a way to visualize. We use nature as a metaphor through language, through art, and other forms. And then we use it, can you do this? <laughs> this is her remote. <laughs> She's been using it for years. And then we use nature as a way to transmit and share values. We take our children to the, wo to the woods as a way to teach them lessons about life. But there's one way of interacting with nature that we haven't really done as a species for a really long time. And that is the notion of learning from nature. This idea of not just studying nature, but using that knowledge to apply that knowledge, to bring about new ideas, to foster innovation, to, to bring about creative solutions. And that is this notion of learning, emulating, and so what we'd like to offer to you is that this discipline that we call biomimicry is not a new way of relating to nature. It's simply a reawakening. Yes, it is an emerging discipline, but it's a discipline of an ancient practice. So, as a discipline, um, that means that there's frameworks and methodologies and tools and rubrics and curricula. But at its core, it is actually going out with the intention of learning from nature. So, our sort of short, short definition of it is the conscious emulation of nature's genius. And those four words are pretty carefully chosen. So, conscious is intent. It's not just we happen to be looking like the way nature works, but we literally have sort of a humbleness within us that we go out and we ask for advice. We ask those other ancestors, those other relatives for assistance. And emulation is also a really important word. No, it doesn't say consciously copying nature. And emulation is kind of a, a it's a difficult word to translate in non-English. Uh, languages, but it's ultimately about pulling the design principle, the design lesson that nature has to offer. So for example, if you've flown on a plane uh, in the last few years, you've probably noticed that a lot of those little um, smaller planes have the flipped up wing tips you've seen on the end there. Well, it wasn't clever engineers that figured out to flip up the wing tips. It was actually the big soaring birds and eagles that have the very ends of their feathers flip up at the end. So obviously we're not gonna build planes out of feathers, but we can look at the ratio of the wing length to the flip of the tip and the angle, and that becomes a design principle that can be translated to our airplanes. So that's in essence what Emulate is trying to get at. And then nature's genius is, well, she has been around a little longer than we have. All those other species have been here quite a bit longer and have figured out a lot of what it means to live here on the planet. So with that assumption, we assume that there's genius in that. So it's really about the bringing together of biology, nature, and life, and the study and understanding of that with the world of design and innovation and technology. And this green circle is where I've been able to uh, work and explore over the last 20 years. 
And it's an incredible, fascinating intersection that has a lot of potential to really help us learn how to be a welcome species again on the planet. So we look into nature as model, measure, and mentor. Um, and it's a very, very different look at how we've interacted <coughs> with nature as part of the Industrial Revolution, which was really about what can we take, right? It was what can we, can we take the soil, can we take the wood, can we take the water, can we take the fish, can we take the space? And instead saying, excuse me, rather than me taking you, can I just borrow your recipe? Uh, what can I learn from you about how you've learned to live well on this planet? So there's a lot of different ways in which people are looking to nature for uh, design ideas. We might look towards form. What are the shapes and structures and patterns that nature uses and how can they impart functions that we need? But we can go beyond that and actually look at processes. So not just what nature has made, but how she's gone about making it. How does nature convert sunlight into sugars? How does nature create light in the case of the lightning bug? But even more valuable would be for us to also ask the questions of not just what shape do you have or how do you do something, but how do you interact and fit in the larger ecosystem? Because we know these are healthy, thriving systems, which is exactly the kind of place that we as a species also want to live. So what I'd like to share with you now is a collection of examples, right? So it's really well and good to talk about this in sort of a theoretical way, but what does it look like and how are people turning this into practice? And I'm going to start with this one and, and talk about it in a little bit more detail, but then I've got another 19 examples to just give you the sense of breadth of how this manifests and what it looks like. And I'm totally happy to answer questions about any of them afterwards. Um, but just to give you a sense of what this could be. So this first one is called whale power. And this picture on your left is the fins of a humpback whale. And humpback whales have these funny bumps on the front of the fins. They're called tubercules. And a, um, an engineer actually was in a, a gift shop uh, about 15 years ago. And he saw this sculpture of a humpback whale and said, that's funny, why are there bumps on the front of the fins? The sculptor must have got it wrong. And the woman in the shop said, no, I know that sculptor. They, they study those whales very well. I'm pretty sure that's where the bump should be. And this scientist, his name actually, maybe coincidentally, is Dr. Frank Fish. Um, of course, whales are not fish, but. Um, and, and he was very intrigued by this because he studied flow dynamics. And so he started looking into it, like what are those bumps about and why are they there? And what he ultimately learned over a series of years in research and experience was that the bumps create a flow structure, a laminar flow structure that decreases drag and sort of increases lift. Now for the humpback whale, which swims in very, very, it's a huge animal. But it swims in very, very tight circles. So it's like, it could be like 20, 25 meters long, but it swims in circles that might be seven, eight meters in diameter. And what it allows it to do is to bank in really tight circles. And then what it's doing is it's blowing bubbles the whole time that it's making this circle. So it makes a tube of bubbles around a school of fish. Right? And the fish don't like swimming through bubbles, so then the humpback whale swims up through the nervous area. In this case, the exchange is nutrients from the water in a fuel cell. It's the molecules that need to react. And they found that if on the inside of the fuel cell, if they created a branching like a sea fan, they'd get far more greater efficiency than the traditional sort of grid-like uh, structure of it branching. So improvements in fuel cells. Now, even something as, um, I remember I put the firefly up there. Well, fireflies have a symbiotic bacteria that lives in their guts. And they really want to maximize the amount of light that comes out of their abdomens. Well, it turns out if you look under a microscope at the coating on that abdomen, it has these really 
cool scale structures that actually magnify the light. <coughs> so now they're developing LEDs where it's not just a clear glass bulb, but actually has a surface structure imprinted that looks like the firefly, and they can get anywhere from 10 to 20 percent more light emitting, and a brighter light emitting from that bulb. Lots of things happen at that microstructure scale. This one was actually a combination of two different uh, organisms. On the left, that's a pitcher plant, which wants ants to slide down inside because it digests ants for breakfast. Um, and the one in the middle is rice grass, which is really trying to funnel the water down in, in terms of grooves. And so they took lessons from both of those properties, what makes it so slippery, what gives it directionality for the water, to create a surface that they can use to build um, water harvesting nets, which will not only capture the water and cause it to be very slippery, but also funnel it down <coughs> to where it needs to be stored. Even looking inside of cells, we can learn different lessons. So these are, this is a, a, a computer rendering of mitochondria. We all have mitochondria in our cells right, right now. That's how we're metabolizing, we're producing the energy that we need to run our own bodies. Well, it turns out that what happens in the mitochondria is something called the Krebs cycle. And Krebs cycle um, grabs oxygen and produces water as part of that process. Takes oxygen, produces water. Well, these folks are up in um, Sweden, and they said, well, gosh, if there's something that grabs oxygen and takes water, that would make an incredible fire retardant. Right? That's what we want to do to stop a fire. Take away the oxygen, add water to the system. And so they were actually able to mimic that part of the Krebs cycle um, in order to create an entirely non-toxic flame retardant. Very different than the things that are put into our furniture, our clothing, uh, our buildings today. In fact, it's made from orange peels and, and lemon peels, uh, mimicking that process. Similarly, looking at a process, um, a dragonfly wing is actually a form of an aerogel. You may have heard of aerogels. They use them a lot in space exploration. This is an example of it. It's incredibly insulative, very, very lightweight, but it's very expensive to produce. So it's only been used in very, very specialized applications. Well, they said, well, obviously the dragonfly doesn't have a lot of money. So how is it producing an aerogel? Because when a dragonfly emerges from its, its, its cocoon, it stretches out those wings, and literally within about 20 minutes, they're dry and stiff. The aerogel is exactly as light as it needs to be, and for a dragonfly, that's really important. And so they, they studied that the dragonfly actually pumps through those veins carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide is able to react with the tissue in such a way that it forms its form of aerogel. And so these folks simply looked at that and started using bicarbonate soda, same thing we bake with. And they were able to totally strip like 80% of the cost <coughs> out of producing an aerogel by learning this lesson from the dragon. These folks ask the question around the process of, well, what is this magic carbon dioxide thing that plants are doing all the time? They're grabbing carbon dioxide, adding water, using a little bit of photons from the sun, and creating sugar molecules. Well, sugar molecules are carbon chains. Petroleum are long carbon chains. Sugars are short carbon chains. And we use petroleum to make plastic. Well, those, those are the carbon chains. So they said, could we make plastic out of CO2? Because remember, petroleum is nothing more than old plants that are all compressed together. And so they figured out the technology um, by mimicking the photosynthetic process uh, in order to grab CO2 and create bicarbonate plastics that are fully biodegradable and are sequestering carbon rather than emitting carbon. They're using current carbon rather than old carbon. 
Also next door to you here, fairly close, um, these folks were interested in pine cones and how pine cones use humidity to control how far open those, what are called bracts, sort of the leaves, if you will, of pine cones, how they open and close in order to release the seeds. And what a pine cone does is it has sort of a layer that responds to moisture by peeling back and another moisture, another layer that responds to dry by going the other direction. And so by creating a bi-layer in the fabric, they could create outdoor clothing that responds to the moisture in your body by those pores opening and them closing as they need to um, by mimicking the pine cone. Now this is an interesting, um, these next two are solving exactly the same problem, but in two totally different ways. And one of the ways you go about biomimicry is you ask the question of who else has this problem that I have and has solved it, or who else might have this problem that I have and has solved it. So biofouling, the, the, um, <coughs> the settling of barnacles and mussels and algae, on ships and other things that we put in the sea is a huge, huge energy cost. You can imagine all that drag caused by a rough surface underneath the water. And we tend to use nasty copper-based paints in order to try to kill <coughs> off any life that might settle. Until these folks said, wait a minute, the fish are swimming in all the sea all the time. They don't have barnacles hanging out of them. They don't have mussels. They're totally smooth. What's their secret? And they found out that fish secrete that biofilm. If you've ever picked up a live fish and it's slimy, that's a biofilm. And the biofilm is invites what's good bacteria to settle, so there's no room for anybody else to settle. They basically take up all of the apartment places, and there's no room for anybody else to settle. So they developed a coating that just invites the good bacteria that's already in the sea to take up all the apartments on the bottom of a boat or wherever that might be. Now this company, uh, actually it's, it's in Germany, in Bremen, um, they asked the same question, you know, how do we deal with this? And what they looked at were different types of seeds that float at sea and don't seem to build a whole collection of organisms attaching to them. This one was one they were particularly intrigued by. It's a palm, and so the palm tree drops its seeds, which float at, this, at the sea. And they put a bunch of these palm seeds in the North Sea, put them out for a few months. Sure enough, nothing landed on them. When they look at them under a microscope, they have all these fine hairs. So then they were able to create a synthetic coating that also had fine hairs, they put that on their test objects, put them at sea for three months, and they had nothing on them. So they were successfully able to emulate that exact same structure. So two totally different solutions coming from two totally different organisms for the same challenge. Also applications in healthcare. This little guy on the left, in, in English we call it a water bear. Um, but it's very, very small. It's called a tardigrade. You may have heard about it. It made the news because it survived a trip to the International Space Station on the outside of the, of the rocket ship and came back and was still alive to talk about it. And um, what tardigrades do is they can, they can live without water. So basically what happens when they dry out, the sugars that are inside are a special kind of sugar. And those sugars form a solid, like an amber, rather than crystals. So not like sugar crystals, which would poke holes in the cell. So when you add water again, it just dissolves that sugar and everything floats around and is good to go. So we can synthesize those sugars in a lab. And that's what this company has done. And they've designed um, a, a, a better method for preserving vaccines that doesn't require refrigeration, which is huge because half of the vaccines that get sent to Africa never actually make it to a person because they have to be thrown away because the, what's called the cold chain. They weren't able to stay refrigerated the whole time. There's a break in that cold chain. 
Also very useful, this when the bird flu hit Asia, um, there was a lot of interest in how to manage uh, viruses and uh, they began looking at, well, how do our own bodies deal with viruses and how do they have receptors that pick them up and catch them so that they don't infect our bodies. Um, and so this company was able to look at those receptors in order to literally sort of snag the viruses so that they wouldn't go through the, the filters, the, the masks and the filters. In this case, rather than applying the health attributes to our own bodies, um, this company also looked under the sea and found this algae um, also didn't, have, didn't actually have slime growing on it. It was very, very clear, clean algae in the ocean. And they asked the question, well, how do you avoid having biofilms? And what they discovered is this algae has the ability to stop bacteria from having a party. They basically make it so that the bacteria can't talk to each other and say, hey, come over here, come over here, let's all get together and form slime. They stop it by plugging their ears. And it's also a compound. The really cool thing about this is you can't develop bacterial resistance. Um, if you're not being killed off as a, as a bacteria. So this compound has the ability to be applied in all sorts of healthcare situations without um, creating sort of the uber bacteria that we're so worried about, the superbugs uh, that we can't solve for. So another uh, really fascinating invention. But then it goes to things like um, learning from the information flows and systems this group in China figured out a better way to time the traffic lights so that by mimicking the way ants communicate and the story that they tell each other about where to go when, and by changing the timing on the traffic lights, they lowered congestion in the city um, by 15 to 20 percent, which meant less idling time, which meant less smog, and so on, by simply changing the algorithm the rules of changing the lights. But there's also applications that are not creating necessarily a tangible object. This is a company in the United States that, um, has, that does service. They do software service. They sort of build platforms. And he was in uh, one of a, bi a biomimicry talk, and he started thinking about the idea of hibernation. He's like, well, if all the other organisms get to do it, why can't my business do it? Why can't we just take a break once in a while instead of always being in growth mode? And he went back and he said to his staff, he said, okay, for the month of December, we're all hibernating. And we're going to tell our clients that we will not interact with them at all, but we're going to use that time to take feedback and reflect on it and improve our systems and work internally. And then come January, we will come back and be in service again. The first year that he did that, um, everybody was like, oh, a little concerned. But his sales increased by 20% the next year. He's like, oh, that's a pretty good deal. So he did it again. He's now done it four years in a row. And each year, the sales have increased 20 to 30% because they took the time to recharge. You know? So he took it metaphorically but definitely was following the same functional role that, that uh, hibernation offers us. Then we can also get into whole systems design. Um, this gentleman, John Todd, was fascinated by the way estuaries clean water. But he didn't want to just create an estuary. He wanted to understand what's going on in an estuary. And he developed, um, this is a combination of lessons from nature, but also using the services of nature. He developed a series of tanks that follow those same principles, that, that use many organisms, many stages um, to clean water. And now his tanks are, this is actually, um, it's in the lobby, the front part of the building of a college dormitory. And it is the black water. It's the waste water from the dorms that goes through this tank. It's that effective at cleaning the black water, which then, of course, gets recycled back up into the rest of the building um, by mimicking an estuary. Um, this is a, 
not too far away from you, also an Applied Sciences University. And um, this is actually a building. There's some close-ups of the building here uh, called Stoas in Wageningen. And the, the architect who worked on this building decided to use life's principles, which are a big part of the exhibit at the Weyerkraum, and, um, and incorporate those into the whole design of the building. So while the building itself doesn't have specific organisms, the whole thing has many, many different pieces. So for example, this, um, this sort of mini classroom that was here, originally the design, they said, well, you got to put a big pier, a big concrete um, pipe or concrete or steel pipe to hold up the next floor. And she said, well, but that's a huge amount of material and wasted space. What would happen if I used the form of the idea of many small units, modular, and, and make use of that space and actually have the room? So that's just one example. They have many, many examples inside the building. If you're ever in Wageningen, definitely take a look. Interface is a company I've been working with for almost full 20 years. And they started with product design and how they could learn from nature to build better carpet tiles. And eventually got into thinking about that ecosystem philosophy and how could they have fibers move through and how do they fit in the larger system. So now they have a project called Networks, and they've gone to the Philippines and Malaysia, and they are um, paying the local communities to pull the old abandoned fishing nets off of the reefs, and then they are turning those nets into carpet fibers uh, that they use in their, in their carpets. So both a win because they get the materials that they need, it's a win because we're cleaning up the reefs, it's a win because it's an economic uh, incentive and boom for the, the communities to uh, take care of those. And then um, really this whole circular economy, which you talk about quite a bit here in Europe, is really mimicking nature's food webs, right? It's really mimicking the idea that nutrients uh, stay in the system and are connected by lots of different parts. Uh, this is just one example of a brewery that's actually in Montana, but it shows how all of the different parts of the brewery um, stay as part of the system. And you have this really interesting opportunity here um, in a closed loop manner to really build a food web uh, in this space to be looking at, you know, how do we keep things in the system. So, that's a big collection, um, and it's a small fraction of the ones that we have in our database. When I first started this work 20 years ago, um, I, I kind of knew all the examples. I could just sort of peel them off and share, and now I can't keep track of them anymore. Our database has over 5,000 uh, examples of what's happening, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of breadth of uh, where that might be. But ultimately, they all fundamentally have this question at their heart of how does nature do X? How does nature um, do the kinds of things that we want to do? How does nature build light and strong? And who might we go ask for that question? How does nature make collective decisions? How do all the fish know? when to turn right now to escape the shark. It's not a manager going, okay, everybody, turn. How do they protect fragile parts? Not a problem, or also a problem that we have to worry about. Organized without managers, wouldn't that be a new way of doing business today? Build resilience, this is a, an immune cell uh, in our bodies. How does nature create vibrant colors? something that we need to do. It wouldn't be nice to do if we could do it without heavy metals. How does nature maintain the health of a community? These are all sea anemones, and they literally all help each other stay well. Ensure durability. This is a, a frog that, to escape from its predators, rolls itself in a ball and rolls down a rock surface, like, like 30, 40, 50 meters, a frog. So clearly something very cool going on with its skin. Um, what might that look like to learn from that? How do we keep surfaces clean? How can we learn from nature about that? This is a cleaner shrimp um, and a goby that's at the, at the washing station. <laughs> how do we manage moisture? You know, how do we 
that we have huge moisture problems and how do we keep moisture in or keep moisture out, depending on what we want to do. How about managing pathogens? Um, this vulture has his head deep in something that we think <laughs> us very, very sick, um, but yet is doing just fine. So what could we learn from that? Or new ways to think about insulating electrical current. Right? We're not the only ones with high voltage current that we have to address. This is the electric eel in the Amazon. Change color on demand. Wouldn't that be great if we could just say, today I want my dress to be red and tomorrow green, and therefore I don't need five dresses in my closet. Hmm? Pack efficiently, distribute resources, resist dehydration. Any question that you might have, we could turn around and ask nature of like, manage resources, maintain health, protect from UV light, lots of examples here. Cooperate to share scarce resources. The, the questions are endless and the answers are even more abundant. Um, and say scaling successful strategies. I mean, you could just go on and on and on, and that's the beauty of what I think Biodiversity offers us as a path forward to figure out how we live on this planet, because we really want to be in a place where we're not just surviving, but we're actually thriving. And that's what we know these other species can teach us, is how to thrive. Now, all of these inventions and innovations are the gee whiz part of biomimicry. What gets everybody so excited and gets in the media and you see these cool pictures of this and this. But what's been fascinating for Thomas and I to watch over all these years is what happens to the people who are practicing. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about the output, the story at the end, but there's an equally interesting um, emergence that happens for the people that are practicing. This sounds pretty amazing already. All these questions that you can ask of nature, and but it doesn't end there. You get a whole lot more out of it. And we speak from experience. We've seen it hundreds of times. If tonight was the introduction to biomimicry and we were engaged in a multi-day event with you and hopefully at some point we will then tomorrow we would ask you to bring your design challenge to the table maybe an architectural challenge maybe an industrial design challenge maybe you're an engineer something or another you just bring an idea a, you know a challenge to the table and then we'll take you outside. I mean, we literally take you by the hand and walk you outside. And it doesn't really matter where we are. We can do it in the Alps. We can do it in Costa Rica. We can do it in the Canadian Rockies. Is you pick your location, we'll take you outside. And what happens when we go outside is <coughs> you're going to bring all of your cleverness with you. All of that you know, everything you've learned since childhood, you will bring that outside. And it's going to be really hard for you at first to let go of that. It's really hard for us to sort of step back from seeing nature, from seeing nature as a model, through the lens through which we have looked at it for all this time. And through methodology, through experience, through exposure, we are gradually helping you sort of shed these layers. And should you, for example, if you had picked the libellin, the dragonfly, as your object of study, something that you could possibly learn from the dragonfly, something you could emulate, we would ask you to not only observe the dragonfly as, at a distance as it sort of flutters by and you can take a quick look at it, but what we'd ask you to do is sort of to awaken your senses. Have you ever had a dragonfly 
walk up your finger. It's, it's, it's an absolutely um, an amazing experience. So what happens in the context of biomimicry is that we awaken our senses and that we find our way back to nature. And it's not in some sort of romantic notion, in some sort of nostalgic, you know, way of finding back. It sort of just happens. It's a byproduct of wanting to learn, byproduct of getting on your knees, byproduct of turning over that rock, of picking up a branch, of having a dragonfly walk up and down your finger. When you go like, this is really cool. And it's all of a sudden, it's this sort of this quieting of our cleverness and connecting with something. We have seen it so many times. It's connecting with something bigger than ourselves. And if it was a multi-day workshop that we had, that we were to conduct here, I can almost, we can almost forecast that on the second night or third night, Yes, we would still talk about design solutions. We would still try to figure out the technical aspects of how the dragonfly um, uh, wing really works. Yes, but our conversation would start, would begin to transition into larger questions. Questions of who we are, questions of how we relate to other species, Questions of how we ought to behave as a species in company of all of nature's genius. Those conversations happen and they happen organically. They're not orchestrated. They simply are an emerging property of engaging with biomimicry, the practice of emulating nature's genius. What I would like you to do, I'm just going to go through it very quickly. I'll show you a few pictures. And I would just like, all I would like you to do is um, maybe sort of think about your first reaction as you see this picture um, and sort of ask yourself, is that, you know, what informs my, my reaction to that picture? And we're not going to discuss it or anything like that. But I think maybe it will help you sort of illustrate that we have these certain filters, perceptions about how we see nature and what biomimicry encourages you to do is to maybe shed that lens and look at it differently. Birds swarming. See Zay Eagle. Different scales. This is a close up of a butterfly. Butterfly eye. Next one. DNA. Biomimicry is a lot of scale dependent. You start seeing things that you would not otherwise see. Spider. Or inchworm. Slug. We tend to have a certain reaction to slugs. We tend not to like them. Maybe looking at food differently. Generally, we look at these at, on dinner plate, octopus, lotus plant, agave, tequila. <laughs> of course, we can relate to something like this. It reminds us of what we look like sometimes. Capture tequila. <laughs> Fowl, peacock, cow, elephant, amazing eye. So when we begin, when we do biomimicry and when we connect with others, we look into the eye of life and it sort of forces us, it encourages us to think about our place, our obligations, our duties to others. As I said, it sort of happens naturally, organically, 
And to me, I'm fascinated by the emulate piece. This is the part that is particularly exciting to me in this day and age where many of us have lost connection to nature and where many of us are really, if we are interested in sustainability at all, we are really at a loss to sort of figure out what we should be doing. And I have had the most profound conversations with people after they have looked in the eye of the other. And when we extend our community to not include, only include our immediate family and friends, but to include all of life, whether it's that one additional species from which we took inspiration, or whether it's all of life. Next one. So these are the type of conversations that naturally arise through the practice of biomimicry. Next one. And so it is no afterthought, it's no accident that biomimicry is really <coughs> predicated on three elements. There are three elements that make up the discipline of biomimicry. That clearly the largest one is the emulate piece, to learn to be inspired by nature's design. But then the other two, which again sort of fall naturally and sequentially, is this notion of finding a connection back with nature. It's all personal, it's not, it's not prescribed, it's not required, but I can tell you it happens naturally. And from there we go into questions about who we are as a species, how ought we to interact with nature, what are our obligations. So it's a sequential, natural, organic process. And so that's why biomimicry, the way we understand it, consists of these three essential elements. The one thing that's really interesting about these as being both legs of the stool, like to me they're sort of non-negotiable, like all three have to show up as part of the process. They are also doorways, they're also entry points. Um, we've had 250 students now go through the graduate program um, at Arizona State University and we polled all of them and said, which door did you enter? Why did you fall in love with biomimicry? And I bet even in this room we could do the same. And very interestingly, it is pretty close to one third for each one. So about a third of the folks come because they're seeking innovation. They want new ideas. They want new sources of creativity. And as Thomas just said, what we see happen for those folks who are like, ah, sustainability, whatever, like just give me ideas, is that the process of going through that leads them to the other two. But then another third of the people come in because they just love nature. And could they really have a job in which they could just like geek out and love nature? And it's amazing to watch them like begin opening their minds to the idea of innovation because maybe they were biologists and they studied nature. And to think about their love of nature being able to apply to innovation and then maybe potentially affect sustainability and having an ethos and, and, and a wellness of being here. And then the last third come in from a sustainability perspective. They're like, we are not doing things right and we need to do things differently. We're looking for anything and everything that will help us do that. In fact, I had a woman once, I love telling this story because it was so amazing. She showed up at our Costa Rica workshop. Okay, Costa Rica. The workshop is called Biomimicry. And she shows up on the first day, she puts her bag in her room, she comes running back to my fellow instructor and goes, I have to go home, I gotta leave, I have to leave. And my fellow instructor says to her, well, oh my gosh, what happened? Is something happened at home? She goes, I hate nature. <laughs> and Karen looks at her, she's like, uh, Costa Rica, biomimicry, did you not know what you signed up for? She says, no, 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 I totally love sustainability, but I don't wanna like, nature. It's out there. <laughs> and what turned out is that when she put her bag in her room, there was a frog in her sink. And that kind of unsettled her a bit. But we convinced her to stay. And um, actually, I should get a picture of her up there because she had like two inch long pink 
fingernails, like you know, yeah. she was and high heels, like she was definitely a city girl. And uh, but she stayed, and by the end of the week, a testament to what Thomas just said, she was on her hands and knees picking up things like scorpion spiders and holding them in her hands with her long pink nails. And um, it was just such an amazing transformation in just a week's time. So these three things all go hand in hand. And it's in, in many ways, you may have heard of the term bionic. Um, and in many ways, it, it is one of the things that differentiates this from bionics, which focuses really primarily on the emulate. And we're saying we ought to also connect. And we ought to also be asking the questions, what's worth solving? You know, do we really want to use biomimicry to design a better nuclear warhead? I don't think the organisms would approve of that. They're not going to like that. That's what we're borrowing those lessons for. So what, what's worth solving? How do we go about solving it? Let's make sure all of those technologies are done in the most sustainable way possible. And can we have a sense of thanksgiving and a reconnection with nature at the same time? Because ultimately, what we know, if you take away one lesson, is that life creates conditions conducive to life. Isn't that the, like the most beautiful thing ever? Wouldn't we all love to have that as our calling card? Hi, I'm a human, and I create conditions conducive to life. But we don't get to say that right now. But it doesn't mean it's not possible. We have to get back to remembering curiosity <coughs> awe and wonder. This is the classic position of a biomimic. And a kid, right? Every kid starts off as a biomimic. They have those kinds of questions. Mama, how do I learn how to live here? And if we get ourselves back in that kid-like state, Mama, Gaia, planet Earth, nature, how do I learn to live here? Then we can start moving ourselves in the direction that we need to. And we really could then say, we can create conditions conducive to life. Um, we can reconnect with our own humanity. Those 36 minutes of the ancient practice of asking our neighbors, how do we live here? We have it in our neurons. We have to remember to do that. So step one, four steps, super easy. Step one, go outside, right? In about 30 seconds, you'll get that opportunity. Go outside and just go for a walk. Go for a walk in a space where you're open to just breathing, right? Not getting on the mountain bike and plowing through, but like breathe, just be, just be in that landscape. And then listen. Step three, listen. What is being offered? What are those lessons being offered up? And a lot of the really interesting stories at the exhibit are ultimately about people here going for those walks, breathing and listening to what the forest has told them. The moon wood, that's a lesson that's listened and heard. And then we can begin to echo back. Then we can begin to echo back and learn about what does it mean to live here. So, on behalf of the other 30 million species, uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs>
And that's ultimately what life principles are trying to do. So I've been working on that collection for 20 years, and it's in its sixth generation. And um, it really is trying to capture what does all of life have in common. And if all of life does that, then maybe it behooves us. Maybe we should do that too. Um, and so we use life's principles as a model. You can design towards it. Like, OK, I'm building a building. What would it look like if I followed all these? You can also use it as an audit after something exists. You can say, OK, ding, ding, ding. Oh, we missed this one. We better go back and try to address this. And oh, we did this one pretty good. And uh, for my class and my students, I asked them to take some ex design that's won sustainability awards and so on and compare them. And it's very interesting to see that a lot of things that are really great design, well, look, they follow life's principles, but they don't always catch them all. Right? In fact, there isn't a single human example that follows all of life's principles. So they really are aspirational goals. Um, we only have 30 million examples that it's possible, right? So we know that it's possible to do that. Um, we just have, that's where our creativity needs to come in. So thanks for asking. I hope you use them. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Dana, yeah. I would love to know, how did, you, how did it actually happen that you started defining these sentences or writing these sentences uh, that now are the life principles? What, oh, that, what, 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 well, you know, that's a funny question. So, um, I was rather young when I started in this work 20 years ago, and um, I was invited for my very first workshop ever to give a, a two-day workshop to um, ex executives at Interface Carpets. And um, I was invited because I had already been connected with Janine, who's the author, the original author of the book, Biomimicry. And they said, oh, well, if you're working with her, then come. And um, so I had to figure out what I was going to do for two days um, with these people. And um, I happened to have found a book called The Way Life Works. And in it, there was several principles. And I thought, well, I don't know, maybe these will be interesting. <laughs> and so I designed an activity that was around um, those principles that were captured in that book, uh, which was designed to be like a high school biology textbook kind of thing, just general ideas. And the, the people just puffed it. They absolutely loved it and really latched on to thinking about uh, and learning about life that way. So then. You know, I, then I used them again, and Janine has some listed in her book, and then over time, I mean, my doctorate's in biology, so it, I really felt like, okay, I need to put the scientific integrity into all of this. And uh, so over time, trying to figure out how to teach people how all of life works in a one-page document <laughs> is really challenging. So over time, it took lots of different forms bringing in different biologists, talking about all the well should go here and what are the relationships. And so it's been a, a lot of thinking, a lot of thought process um, behind it. But its impetus was really, I needed something to teach for two days at a workshop. And it was only part of the workshop, but people really liked that. Um, and then off it went. And here it is. And now it's an exhibit in Austria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who would have thought? Okay. Great. Nice. You know, uh, yeah. when I make, uh, when I guide the audience through the through the exhibition, sometimes I say, imagine the non-living nature and the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. And biomimicry life principles is the laws of nature for the living, for the living. part of nature. Is exactly. that right? That is exactly right. Did I get right. that right? Yeah, it is exactly right. Because, and, and when you look at the life's principles up close, it talks about these are the rules of living on this planet. Mm -hmm. And this planet happens to have things like gravity. It happens to be changing all the time. If this place never changed, then a lot of life's principles wouldn't matter. Because once you figure something out, you just keep doing it over and over and over again, and it won't matter. Um, so those, the, what we call the operating conditions define life's response. Um, to those. So they very much are the things that are the rules for the living organisms because if they don't follow them, they go extinct. And that's the harsh reality for us as a species. 
If we don't start following these life principles, we too will go extinct. You know, um, and we have plenty of evidence to support that right now. So yes, it's the rules of living, and as long as we can remember that we Homo sapiens are one of the 30 million species, and that we are not immune to the laws of natural selection, um, then we get to stay. And if not, then uh, what's interesting about the 30 million species? That's only. 1% of all the species that have ever lived on the planet. So most of the species have already gone extinct. So we're seeing like the creme de la creme. Like we're seeing these success stories. Of course, some was bad luck, you know, asteroid, ice age, you know, those sorts of things. But, um, and that's what a lot of the mass extinctions were about, big, huge catastrophes. But other species that are just fossils, um, they were not able to adapt to changing conditions. They were not able to be resource efficient um, or whatever it might be and, and then they weren't able to reproduce and they weren't able to stay. You know, and even things like you see, I was reading an article the other day about um, infertility, you know, the inability to reproduce. Infertility rates are going really rocketing high in some communities like 20, 30 percent. That's huge, right? That's natural selection saying, those chemicals are not so good for you. You know, I mean, that's that's where we are. So it's the rules of living, for sure. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing. Good. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, how do you, I mean, uh, let's say I have a question for nature. How can I start to filter uh, through the 30 million species? <laughs> because otherwise it would take me some white time to yeah. relax. Yeah. How do you do that? Well, it's a great question. I mean, there's sort of the, the technical answer, which is you learn the process and, and you make friends with biologists and you begin to learn how to unpack. Like over the years, we've, that's part of the emerging discipline is learning the practice of trying to find that. Um, but there's also something really magical that I think you know, maybe Thomas could speak to that when you get out and you reconnect, it's as if it's almost as if those answers reveal themselves to you. You know? They, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I also want to add, you mentioned ask nature. Yes, oh, thank you. So, more on the practical side of things, rather than the, ooh, it falls out of the sky. <laughs> um, so, we also have built a database called Ask Nature. And um, you literally can say, how does nature communicate? How does nature create color? How does nature build lightweight? There's, there's 3,000 strategies in Ask Nature, so 1% or less, quick math. And um, which for me as a biologist, I'm like, oh, we barely scratched the surface. But most people, when they go in there, they just, they get lost for hours. And they just are like, oh, look at this, look at this, look at this. So it is one way that we've tried to make it a little bit more accessible. Yeah, and then the other way is really these life principles. Like there's, while they are sort of master principles for all of life, they can be actually really, really informative as you think about what some of your challenges are. Of course, the case studies are much more specific, but um, those can also be really useful, and they're more accessible that way. Good question. Thank you. All right. Other questions? Yeah. What was the last thing that you discovered when you went out in nature that really made you feel oh, like Oh boy, let's see. <laughs> Good traces. I just, every time, like, you know, sometimes people ask me what my favorite organism is. I'm like, I can't tell you because what about all the other ones that I didn't say, you know? <laughs> like, they're, they're all so friggin' amazing. And I, I love that despite having done this and being exposed for so many years um, to all this amazing biology that I just, I just continually get uh, amazed and amazed and amazed. I, I think, Elizabeth, you told me something today that I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Um, that I had never, I hadn't really thought of it. I hadn't heard of it before. I remember. It was something, but well, so even talking about the wood bee today, most organisms, um, when they clone themselves, they clone of the same gender. But apparently, the wood bee, when it clones itself, it clones males, even though it's a female. 
um, which is pretty cool, like making clones of the opposite gender. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I mean, there's so many, and it's just never ending. I just, the aerogel example was one I just added, it's the first time I've, I've shared that one. And just thinking about a whole dragonfly wing being an aerogel, I mean, it's just, and just one organism. We, I give, I give the students a quiz. I ask them to go into Ask Nature and find how many strategies does the honeybee show up in Ask Nature. And it's like 15 different pages the honeybee has of all of these different cool things that it does. So it's really kind of endless. That's my roundabout answer to your question. <laughs> What's in the dream book for Biomimicry 3.8? Hmm. Well, we have a couple of really interesting efforts underway now. So one is, so the, this master's degree that we created at Arizona State, um, I've now been approached by several different universities in Latin America to translate the whole program into Spanish, um, which opens up an entire continent plus, you know, um, for the content, which would be really cool. And the World Bank, uh, when presented with 10 ideas from the university, they pointed to that one and said, that's the one we want to fund. That sounds the most interesting, most impactful. Um, so we already have verbal confirmation on funding, which is really cool. And um, the other big initiative that we're working on is something that we, we call it design for ecosystem services. And it's based on the idea that the local ecosystem and the metrics and processes of a local ecosystem should be the building codes and the guidelines for how we create our structures. And so, for example, if the local forest puts 30% of the rainwater back into the ground table, then it behooves us, it's our responsibility if we're going to put a building there, to make sure that building puts 30% of the rainwater that hits the building back into the ground. So that's part of functioning like the forest that we're in. So we have a program called Factories of Forest. And again, Interface, which I mentioned, we, we started with them with just a carpet tile. And they just, and there's the carpet tile is actually in the exhibit, so you can see it. And it was just a workshop, and they got really excited about it. Well, that carpet tile did so well, it ended up being a $350 million a year business for them. Um, wish I had asked for a small percentage of <laughs> royalties on the idea. But um, then they quickly moved into, well, how do we make these carpet tiles? And you know, what does it mean to, you know, to put them in place? And they have a new system that doesn't involve glue. And then they started asking the question of, well, where do we get our fibers? So that was the networks example from the fishing. And now they're saying, what about our manufacturing facilities? And so they've redesigned um, the facility in Georgia and the United States and one in Australia. And the next one is um, in the Netherlands, where they're asking the local ecosystem to guide them. And I just had a conversation on Monday, actually, with a woman who's working with the, the Dubai Port Authority and beginning to think about what if a port was um, functioning like the ecosystem, the estuary in which it is, right? When a port goes in place, we just know that, well, say goodbye to all life. Say goodbye to the fish and the train and everything. But imagine if you knew when a port came in, it was actually restoring and enhancing the ecosystem services. So mm -hmm. that's another big, huge piece that we're really excited about um, now. Um, but, you know, our work has always been 20, 30 years ahead of most of the world. So the world's catching up to where we were 20 years ago. And being able to sort of work with all of that while still pulling this leading edge of what could be possible is, is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are two that are on our mind. Yeah. Uh, what is the main target group you're working with? Is it the industries, uh, NGOs, education? All of the above, but we work with the most innovative early adopters in all of those places. So um, we work with the companies that pride themselves at being the most innovative versus companies who are like, yeah, I'll do it when I see somebody else do it first. Right? Or we work with, so for example, we went to Arizona State University because they are ranked and have been now for four years in a row the number one most innovative kind of university in the United States. And so that was the kind of place we wanted to go and, and 
to be a part of. Um, so we're doing education, we're doing industry, we're doing um, government, nonprofit, anywhere where people are curious, willing to, to take risks, because this is still new, right? It's still an emerging discipline. Um, even though there's all of these case studies, it's still not an everyday standard practice. Um, so that's, that's what we see. So are important. there programs, particularly for kids? Yes, there are. So um, on the Ask Nature site, there's a whole collection of resources, including curricula for children. Um, and uh, we actually teamed up with a musician who made this beautiful, beautiful um, children's CD called Ask the Planet um, Music. And like 12 songs, life's principles are in there. They're just beautiful songs because she got all these famous musicians to be part of it. And so yeah, on Ask Nature, you can find resources that can be really useful all, at all different age groups in there. So yeah, I mean, in a way, that's this, the, the idea of this being an emerging discipline means we have to put all these tools and practices and examples and methods out there um, to sort of capture the imagination of, of, of sort of traditional 21st century thinking. But yet, to Thomas's point, we're really just tapping right back into being humans again. So there's there's a science and a deep practice of it, and then there's just sort of like being with it. And so we work on both, you know, try to find ways to work on both. And different audiences will require different kinds of conversations, you know. So if I'm in a room and they're all technical PhD engineers, then I put on my geeky science hat and I use all of the, the, the right, you know, and the correct terms and the graphs and everything that makes them happy. Um, but then if it's more of a general audience, then I know in this room I've got a mix of everybody and you have to appeal and, and connect at all those different levels. The head, the heart, the mind. Um, and, but there's no shortage of places where this can be applied. I mean, I, the only question I've ever had where I was like, eh, I don't think nature can answer that. <laughs> we literally got a call from somebody that wanted us to design something for a supersonic engine that was like 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And I was like, life just doesn't do 5,000 degrees. Eh? I can't think of anything that will help you. Um, but every other question, I'm continually amazed at, at, that we, you know, continue to find answers, find really interesting answers. Um, part of it depends on how far you want to go back in the equation. So uh, we did some work with Boeing, and I'm not sure if you know how airplanes are assembled, but they're basically sheets of, of steel that are riveted together, right? So bolts and screws that hold each panel to the next one. Well, on a, an average sized airplane, like a 737, there's a million of these rivets. And one rivet costs $10. So $10 million in the cost of an airplane goes into the rivets. And um, so they brought us in and they asked us to redesign the rivet. And, and so the, they were you know, telling me about the sheer forces and the strength and all these things that Rivet had to say, do. And they said, well, so how would nature solve it? I said, well, nature wouldn't create something that needed to maintain pressure and cut it into little pieces and try to like, hold it back together again. You know? <laughs> and so we talked about um, worms and, and other organisms and how they really are a continuous band. You know, a continuous band of fibers that go all around the outside so you don't have any seams. You don't need stitches. You don't need rivets, bolts to hold things together. And um, so that actually was part of what led to what's now the Dreamliner, which is a carbon composite um, uh, core tube. But here's the really funny thing. So they, they manufactured this tube like a big ace bandage, right? So they wrapped it around and they got their carbon fiber and they put all of the resin in and all of this stuff. It was incredibly strong. But they didn't trust it, so they cut it into pieces <laughs> and ripped it from back together. <laughs> <coughs> totally crazy. So there, we, have, we have some work to do. <laughs> But so some of it is what questions do we want to ask? Like how far back in the problem space are we willing to go? 
And uh, to a degree, they were willing to reconsider how they even assemble the tube. So maybe the next move will be to actually keep it, keep it whole. We'll see. Thanks for your question. Yeah? How do you see technology like, for example, 3D printing, changing the way that we build things? It's huge, right? Specifically like fit, fit form to function mm -hmm. and other aspects. Yeah, you yeah. see it entering into the work that you guys are doing. What's really cool about now, like this point in human history, is this, of course, we have this awareness and this connection um, across the planet. We have access to these amazing stories. And we have technology that not only allows us to see things we could never see before, so like the scanning electron microscope, so we can see what the scales look like. We also have technology, enabling technology, that allows us to mimic that actually emulate. So I think something like additive manufacturing, 3D printing, um, is as close as we can currently get to the way nature assembles, right? building from the bottom up. Now, the problem with 3D printing as it is today is it still uses toxic materials, it still throws the thing out at the end of the day, and it's still using our old engineering blueprints. So one of the things that we're trying to do at Arizona State is to say, what if we put nature's blueprints in there? Let's use nature's forms, which we know um, have the right kind of stress factors or whatever it might be that we need to capture um, into the software. What if we look at nature's molecules, nature's chemistry, to figure out what we put in the goop? Okay? And should we not be developing a system so that there's take back and there is recycling and reuse of those molecules so that it's not like, oh, we built that prototype. Oh, we can just print another one, print another one. I mean, if you think about it, it will not be long. You can have a 3D printer at your house right now, but do you really want your four-year-old taking out the trash of that extra bottles and goop and what's left over? I mean, it's, it's nasty stuff that's in there. In the wood. What's that? Even the wood printing? I mean, not all 3D printing, right? There's some. I mean, they are actually 3D printing with food. Yeah. Um, I saw one 3D printer, really cool, that just uses sand and uses um, concentrated solar as a way to melt the sand to 3D print. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of really cool things happening. Um, but as you know, the, the gentleman you went to the workshop with, he studies 3D printing and he's interested in uh, the nature's hexagons and different shapes and what are the rules that guide that so that we can get different functionality out of our materials by using nature's shapes in different ways. And so that's what he's studying now. Um, so yeah, really cool stuff. Great question. Yeah, so that's part of that ancient can you, practice. Can you repeat she the asked question? if we worked with indigenous people. Okay. Right? Um, that's a, a big part of the ancient practice piece. Uh, if you look at the stories and narratives that are in many indigenous cultures about their strategies for living well, they're connected to the biology of the place. They're connected to the organisms and what they've learned about that place. Um, we've been having some of those early dialogues. There's a lot of sensitivity around it, as you can imagine. Um, indigenous cultures have been mined for their knowledge for far too long. You know, what, you know, what pharmaceuticals can you tell me about? And, and so we want to be really smart and really sensitive to how we are doing that. But it's definitely part of, you know, honoring that narrative because I think there's a lot, I think an amazing PhD study would be to literally trace those stories back to the organisms that, that told them. Like, so for example, I know of one in a, um, a desert in Colorado, in the desert southwest of the United States, the peoples that moved in there only moved in 800 years ago, which is relatively short for the US, for, for native cultures. And when they moved in, they didn't know how hot the summers got or how cold the winters got. So they went around and there's these small squirrels, ground squirrels, that burrow under the ground and they make um, bedroom chambers, little housing underground. And they went around and measured how deep 
those bedroom chambers were underneath the dirt. And because they were using the same building material, clay, to build their adobe houses, they used that measurement that they found, wow, all these bedroom chambers are a consistent 23 centimeters beneath the soil surface. So maybe 23 centimeters is the perfect insulated thickness, and then that's what they use to build their walls. So that's like a really literal um, learning, but I think there's a lot more. I'd be really fascinated for, you know, to unpack what that could look like, you know. And maybe that's part of that remembering for us, is to remember how to do that. Thank you, that's a good question. Excellent, yeah. What is the stand of natural intelligence to artificial intelligence? Hmm. You know, I mean, there's some interesting, I'm not sure exactly where you're going with that question, but I'll loosely respond and then you let me know. Um, personally, you know, artificial intelligence is still based on human cleverness, right? And, and I think, Thomas, you're reading that book that, that talks about, um, are we smart enough to know just how smart animals actually are? Okay. So we, we base all of our notions on intelligence on the human model without recognizing that all those amazing species may also have amazing amounts of intelligence. We saw today, if you visit the exhibit, you can, you can hear a plant singing right, through an algorithm where it's sharing information. And, you know, you study plant intelligence, right? But very few people will put the word plant and intelligence together in the same sentence. Um, but yet we know, so how is it the plants know when to drop their leaves? How is it that they know when to change color? How is it they know how to pull these molecules back and let other molecules go when they shed their leaves? How do they know when insects are coming in to build up their defenses? All things that we don't have a freaking clue about. And so, what worries me about artificial intelligence is that we've really, we've really we've such a small definition of what that could be. And imagine if we had ways to tap into the broader sense of, of nature's intelligence. And it's one of the reasons why I put that first thing up at the beginning that sort of puts us clever humans in, in perspective on the grand scale of things um, in terms of, of where we might go. Did I answer your question? Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> um, it's also, in, you know, I mean, there's also the genetic engineering is based on human cleverness and sort of misses a lot of, you know, the, to think that we understand how it all works and to act so brazenly is really kind of risky. Um, we, we really, even though we're young, we're really like toddlers, uh, two-year-olds, but we act like teenagers, right? You all have teenagers in your life at some point. They think they know it all, but they really don't, and then they just get themselves in trouble. That's kind of where the human species is right now. Um, but I think there's like the algorithm is built into the traffic lights and all of that. You know, there there is a form of learning that's built into those systems, which is really interesting about the whole AI space around that. We can talk more in a minute. Other questions? Yeah. We were talking so wonderfully how we could approach nature more like kids do. Mm -hmm. um, and do you also work with kids and use their ideas and creativity to integrate um, the research? Yeah, that's a great question. I personally don't. Um, I mean, our kids are growing up now, they're teenagers. And, um, Partially because I don't have, I'm a little impatient to wait for the next generation to figure out what to do. Like, I want to work with the ones that are making the decisions right now. But as I mentioned before, Ask Nature has a lot of activities and there are a lot of people that work with kids. I do give my students, which are mostly working professionals, so in the master's program, 80% of the students in the program have full-time jobs and have been working 10, 15 years, 20 years in those jobs. Um, and I give them the job the tasks of like for the life's principles. One of their um, assignments is to go find a kid and explain life's principles to them. Um, and so I, I do try to create those exchanges of information. 
We also, um, the nonprofit, the Biomimicry Institute, also does a global design challenge, and there is a, a youth competition, there's a kids competition in there. And so it's really fun to see what, what they come up with. If I may just add, I mean, if you're thinking about maybe exposing children to this, they're very, they make excellent candidates <laughs> because they don't come with a lot of this sort of cleverness, but they're very receptive to just one going outside, two exploring, and if they sort of have free reins, it's amazing what kind of ideas they come back with. Online course available to study the biomimicry, maybe from Austria? Absolutely. Actually, the entire master's degree is all online. Oh, it is. So it you is. don't have to be in Arizona. You do not have to be in Arizona. In fact, 30% of our students are international um, and never step foot in the United States. And, you know, maybe 2% live in Arizona. So I, I, I know how to spell their name, but I've never met them in person, right? Because <laughs> I've seen their name on my little computer screen. Um, but yeah, the whole thing is done online. Um, and that was by, it's not ideal, right? I, I've had people say I've spent less time in nature since I started this course um, because they're taking their classes online. But it was a decision made in order to make it far more accessible so that you don't have to come there. Anymore. And you have to do the uh, workshops at the next one. <coughs> that's right, that's right. And you can do the local it. workshops. <laughs> And we, that's why we also have these week-long immersion workshops, um, which Thomas talked a little bit about, Costa Rica and Australia. We're, we're actually going to be in Croatia next June doing one on social innovation. So not the technical side, but the social innovation side. Um, and so those are a great way to sort of experience it in person. But even on our website, we have like a four-hour course um, that you can take to just sort of get started. And, um, but yeah, definitely, that was the plan. But it's in English. Oh. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Excellent questions, everybody, thank you. Thanks for staying, thanks for coming, um, and taking a little bit of your summer evening out. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Dana and Thomas, I think it was a very inspirational evening, and um, yes, I follow up your suggestion. So the, the, the next or nearest experience of biomimicry is the exhibition, the uh, Alphabet des Lebens, Lernwerkstatt Natur, in a Werkraumhaus in Andersburg. Ich würde mich freuen, wenn Sie sich die Ausstellung noch bis 6. Oktober ansehen. Und, uh, Es gibt auch noch einige Programme, auch äh, unter anderem ähm, Exkursionen in die Natur, alles auf unserer Webseite zu finden. Und ich bedanke mich nochmal äh, für die Aufmerksamkeit und an, bei meinen Kooperationspartnern äh, für, die für das Ermöglichen diesen, dieses Abends. Dana und Thomas sind immer noch äh, hier, also für jemanden, der sich jetzt vielleicht nicht im großen Auditorium äh, gewagt hat, eine Frage zu stellen, kann sie jetzt sicher noch stellen. Und äh, ja, nochmal ganz herzlichen Dank. <lacht> so, jetzt gebe ich das dir wieder zurück. Ja. Und? Es läuft immer noch, obwohl er schon gesagt hat, nur Battery und das kommt nicht. Also drei, zwei oder drei. Ja. <lacht>